first to see them. It touched a nerve. Soon it took off and became the biggest picture show for 50 years. The pictures affected people across the country and around the world. They called it, here is New York. This is the story of how it happened. And it's also the story of four New Yorkers who become involved with their pictures as they try to rebuild their lives over a terrible year. I'm Reggie Nadelson. I'm a writer. I've lived downtown here, not far from Grand Zero, all my life. In the days after September 11th, like thousands of New Yorkers, I'm desperate to do something. The volunteer jobs are all filled. There are waiting lists. Then one day, around the corner from my apartment, I see a guy hanging photographs in a shop window. Do you need any help, I say. What can you do, he says. Nothing, I say. I'm a writer. Okay, he says. You're in sales. Here is New York takes its name from a prophetic essay written more than 50 years ago. The city, for the first time in its long history, is destructible. A single flight of planes, no bigger than a wedge of geese, can quickly end this island fantasy, burn the towers, crumble the bridges. The intimation of mortality is part of New York in the sound of jets overhead. The author was E.B. White. The title of his essay was, Here is New York. Michael Shulin is a local writer who owns part of the shop. On September 12th, the day after the, uh, the destruction of the World Trade Center, I was sitting down here and there was a man, a street artist, who had a sheet of the New York Times in which he wrote a poem which he put on the front window and a crowd of people collected. And I had an old picture of the World Trade Center and I taped it to the window and an even larger crowd collected. Michael called some friends, including teacher and photographer Charles Traub. I got students and volunteers and staff and we brought some computers down here. Michael was hanging in the wires. I went to the hardware store and I bought some wire and some clips until I finally found one that wouldn't fall out and then we put up some pictures. And it was up. In four days it was up. And from the first moment we were flooded with people coming in with pictures. It just took off by word of mouth. We felt that all the pictures should be displayed as many as possible in as much profusion as possible with no names, no frames. After 9-11, the city reinvents itself. People improvise. A gym becomes a morgue, a hotel lobby, a hospital. A shop becomes a photo gallery. Oh my God. They decide to keep it simple. All the photos will be copied on basic printers. The pictures will be sold to the public at $25 each. The proceeds donated to a charity for children who have suffered as a result of 9-11. I'm buying a few remembrances for family members for Christmas mm -hmm. that won't be able to come here and see this in person. And it's pretty disturbing. I have to fight back the tears in here. I was in the World Trade Center when the plane hit. And I work a quarter mile away, so I watch both of the buildings collapse. So this is sort of like coming to the wake of a good friend. Over the year, I get to know a few people I meet through the photos at Here is New York. Volunteers, people who took the pictures, people who bought them. Most of all, people in them. People like New York firefighter Billy Green at Engine 6. Only four blocks away, the World Trade Center was just a routine call. On 9-11,
Billy Green went in with four other men from his company. Only Billy came out. He doesn't remember his picture being taken that day. He hasn't met photographer Tim Brace since then. I thought we were going to be tramping. Basically, that's where I kind of collapsed. Shortly after that, an uh, army paramedic came up to me. Oh, really? Started taking my vitals, and uh, he thought I was having a heart attack. They gear up and washed me off with sponges, and they brought me into the emergency room. They uh, said they didn't think I had a coronary episode, but I inhaled a lot of garbage. They can't tell how much asbestos is in our lungs, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's there. We're just walking, uh, walking dead people. The people who come here are not people who normally would go to an art show. This is not an art show, but the, you, have, you have cops, you have firemen, you have bankers, you have kids. It's really a whole cross-section of America. It's really the way that America has always been said to work, but, but perhaps hasn't always worked. Jojo Capestro worked at an investment banking firm on the 87th floor of Trade Center One. She didn't feel great that morning, decided to go to work anyway. It was a beautiful day. She was in her office thinking about going out for a cigarette when the plane hit just three floors above her. When the tower fell, she thought she'd died. Months later, for the first time since then, she meets Eric Tischler, the man who took her picture on September 11th. I have to tell you, Eric, when I saw that picture, you weren't invading my life. You actually gave me closure for that day because to be there and to be in that and to escape and to be alive, to tell about it, and then to see it, I was like, I was really there. Because sometimes I feel like it's a bad, bad dream. I mean, for months I didn't sleep at all, at all. I would just try and sleep, but every hour on the hour I was up. Now I'm finally getting sleep ever since I saw the picture. So it was helping my therapy. Here is New York. From the start, it's run by volunteers. It's a focus for the neighborhood in the aftermath of September 11th. People just show up with skills or no skills. People who need to do something. People like Lara McPherson. My dad was in the Pentagon that day, but he's fine. <laughs> And that's where the plane hit, and that's where he was. So I think that's what keeps me here. I think that has a lot to do with it. A guy from the New York suburbs, Chris Cawley, joins up. Right now we're at about a six-week backlog, because I think we're up to about 45,000 orders. And I don't think there's enough printers that can fit in this room stacked tenfold to print that many to keep it up to date. So. Um, that's a good kind of problem to have, though, you know? Because it means we're probably, I think we're up to about a million dollars for the kids now. Lucille Blair runs an art website. Coming out of the Wall Street subway on her way to work, she saw the second plane hit. Her photo was taken as she was running home to Brooklyn on the bridge, desperate to get to her son. She felt she was reliving a nightmare. The feeling I had was so familiar at that moment. I it was, you know, panic and horror and shock and dismay and complete terror. And my husband died five, almost six years ago, and it was the same. I couldn't know why it was feeling familiar, and it was the same feeling that I had when the police called me because he he was hit by a car and it was all very sudden. And. Um, and, and all I could think was because when, 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 we when we were running, there was all this paper, you know, it's like this confetti in the sky. So it had this weird smell and smoke and this sort of this paper fluttering down. And then it got to the ground, finally, like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes later, and there were bits of people's lives. And I could, that was the moment when I thought, when I realized there were people who were dying and people who were dead. I, don't, I didn't see many funerals in here. I saw one with the old truck 
with the casket on the top. With a new batch of pictures, he wants to offer volunteer Jay Manis. A Canadian fire chief, Richard Sullivan, stops by. That's kind of one of my favorites. That's an incredible picture. He just identifies the emotion so totally. I mean, it takes, I know what it's like to be a kid crying, and you know what it feels like, and you could see it all in his thing. He's wearing a fire hat, his father's fire hat. The body wasn't recovered, that's his hat. Every day, people walking in with astonishing pictures. This is a heartbreaking picture. See a woman here in the hole. This is the shape of the plane. This is the hole the plane made. You can see this tiny woman here. The photos provoke tears, anger, discussion, reflection. This is exactly what the Taliban hated about our culture. I mean, they had laws against photography. Individual expression was something they tried to squelch in their, in their culture. And this is exactly what they wanted to destroy. Elaine Williamson is a school teacher. She lived next door to Grand Zero. The destruction of the Twin Towers completely wrecked her family home. My tea server sat right on here for 20 some years. Where did you get the tea set from? You know, the tea set is pewter. It was a wedding gift from a bunch of my mom's friends. I love the picture, I love the tea service. It's so important to me, it has such memory. So, and the fact that people can look at this incident and see something that is remarkable, sort of Pompeii-ish, is fine with me. We are 36 feet across from Trade Center 4, which would have been right out those windows where the little plant is still hanging. Before the attack began on 9-11, Elaine was already uptown at the school where she teaches science. It was days before she was even allowed into her apartment. This, this pot, this bowl, which is underneath here someplace, filled now with stuff, is filled with a lifetime of pictures. And, and the kids would come and they would sort through all of our friends. Even our friends would come and sort through here, looking to see what was new. For 25 years, Elaine and her husband, Ron, raised their family here. For weeks after September 11th, the city is in shock. The area around Grand Zero becomes a huge memorial. Sightseers and disaster tourists swarm around the area, taking photographs as if there's no reality without them. God bless America! And then the kitsch merchants invade the Ground Zero neighborhood.
Billy Green comes by to see the pictures with some workmates from Engine 6. Brothers, as New York firemen call each other. Billy's running. Okay, Billy's running. That's where I finally, uh, I mean, a paramedic came up to me. But I don't remember that picture being taken. Stirs up a lot of memories for me. It's upsetting. Billy tells me what happened to him on 9-11. It becomes clear why he still finds his own picture hard to deal with. We grabbed our gear and we uh, started running in and I looked up and people were jumping. And now uh, we ran into the lobby and uh, our officer reported into the fire command station and we uh, started heading up uh, the B staircase. And uh, many people were coming down. We were going up. Um, when we got to about the 17th floor, about, about the 14th floor, that's when we heard, heard uh, another plane. Uh, I heard a radio transmission on Handy Talking. Another plane! Another plane! And when I got to about the 37th floor, that's when the building violently shook. We were tossed around on the stair. I had John my face piece. I thought maybe we were hit by another plane or something. And then someone uh, popped their head in the stairway and said, two World Trade just fell down. And about 30 seconds later, there was an order given to evacuate on a handy talkie. There was uh, um, someone outside. He was covered in dust, and he had pointed up, and he told us to hold up. So we took that as something was coming down. And it was jumpers. And uh, then he said, uh, come on, come on. But I know I turned and I looked at this pile. Uh, I know the pile was bodies, but I didn't see bodies. I saw uh, a pile of, like, dead cows. I started heading north. I got about a block north, and uh, the tower started. Someone yelled, it's falling. And I looked back, and I looked up, and... Uh, it looked like the top 15, 20 floors were starting to tilt towards me and fall, and I started running for my life. And I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. I felt like the Michelin Man running with my gear on. And then I was enveloped in uh, this blast. Papers on fire. It was all orange. You could see it was just two papers and then just thick black ash and smoke. Uh, what saved my life was I was able to get my face piece on just as this blast came. I was expecting something solid to hit me in the back, but it didn't. And uh, I was actually crying in my mask, saying I couldn't believe this building fell down, choking. And I walked across this baseball field with my arms stretched out like a baby in front of me. And then everybody started running up West Street. Uh, they were afraid another plane was coming and another building was falling down. They were afraid I was going to get trampled again. Um, I tried to run up there. I got about a block north and then I fell down on a sidewalk and I was just out of it. And uh, I believe that's when that picture was taken. Billy was in the hospital for two days. When he got out, he wanted to go straight back to see what happened to his brothers at Engine 6. They brought me here, and that's when I learned that uh, no one else made it out, and I was the only one. And it's been rough. The photo of Lucille Blair, the lady on the bridges we volunteers think of her, has become so well known, people stop her on the street. But Lucille finds that New York, resilient, self-obsessed, is getting back to business. I think that, in mean, all that wonderful bravado and all that drama and all that sort of rethinking your life and redefining your life, all that sort of thing happens after any kind of tragedy, whether it's personal or on a much bigger scale. And, um, but we're consumed by our day-to-day -day lives. And New York is a fairly chaotic place, 
to live in, and, and, that, and that's what grips us mostly on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think, um, no, I, I don't think we become a gentler, kinder, more spiritual group of people, necessarily. I think we become more aware of how fragile we are in the world and how vulnerable we are. The man who took Lucille's photo, Richard Rutkowski, comes into the gallery. After we started walking, For Richard, the story began amid the chaos of September 11th on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and I don't, in all honesty, remember taking the photo. I mean, I'm sure what I did is I was walking along looking for shots to take, and I saw this person with this amazing expression on their face, and I just picked the camera up and snapped the shot encapsulated for me a lot of how that felt because here you have one person who's extremely affected and who's you know really in the situation and then you have these other people who seem very disaffected and who seem a bit confused by it all and in all honesty that's what it was like crossing the bridge that morning you had people who were very upset and crying and you had people who quite frankly just looked like they were inconvenienced that it was an annoyance but not but not a terrible tragedy I don't think for some people, stuff had sunk in yet. Months after 9-11, Elaine Williamson's apartment still resembles a war zone. Getting the place clean is an uphill battle. It's just all, it's just so, as, as you look around, you can see how just incredibly overwhelming it is and the where to begin and how to handle it and where to start. We certainly are hoping to come back. We uh, are planning to, the landlord says that he will repair these places and replace and fix and clean and paint and he's being very nice about it and we're hoping that that's indeed what will happen. Some people think it'll be freaky to know that that's a graveyard. But um, today I saw something on the television that talked about all the souls going out into the oceans, you know, flying through the Hudson. And I'm a marine biologist, so I loved that explanation that the souls were flying out into, into a, you know, a better place than where they are across the street, no less. Little creamer. Unlike many other photos at Here is New York, Elaine's tea set is one picture people often feel they can bear to hang on the wall. A family friend took photographer Ed Keating into the apartment soon after September 11th. I think it's a very peaceful picture. And I think it, it came at a time where people were, were, were extremely upset. People were very worried. People had no idea what was, what the future was going to, what the, what the future held. Myself and I think many people started playing these end of the world scenarios. And I think it had a way of sort of evoking a certain kind of peacefulness in the middle of all this destruction that there still is some sort of order and there still is beauty and everything is not terrible. Everybody wanted to see the face behind the hair. <laughs> Jojo Capestro comes back with photographer Eric Tischler to the place where he took her picture on September 11th. I had my uh, cell phone in this hand. I had the water bottle in this hand. I had my shoes like this, look. The events of that morning constantly play in her head. Boom! The building started shaking left to right. We didn't know what was going on. We thought, I thought it was a bad dream. I mean, there were fireballs outside our windows. There was smoke. There were bodies flying in the air. We were just whipping down the stairs. Once we got to 78, I mean, my body was shaking like this. Shaking, 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 shaking. I just couldn't... I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a bad dream. I was so scared. I was like, what's going to happen next? When we got to 78 and there was no exit, I was like, that's it. We're going to die. I lost it at that point. I looked outside and all you saw were the people that jumped. I saw a man 
through a pole, a pole was through a man. I saw two people, two people hugging by the customs house with a piece of metal through their body. I saw jumpers with no heads and no legs, just torsos. I saw a lot of death and devastation at that point, and I fainted right in the policeman's arms. I turned around. I saw the building hot lava. I saw the, the fire. And all of a sudden, you hear a roar. And everyone was going, look out. I ran across the street. I ran as far as I could go. A priest grabbed me, a priest, in front of the church and pulled me, covered me while I was under the car. And I was like, Father, Father, I'm saved. He goes, don't worry, my child, you're going to be fine. I was like, I just want to go to heaven. I just want to go to heaven. The priest was still saying the Hail Mary. At that point, everything was white. And the priest was praying. And I was like, I died on went to heaven. Jojo's friend Dominique still doesn't want to talk to us about what happened that day. Somebody yells, Joey, Joey, some body full of debris, covered. Joey, I was like, Dominique. She was right behind me. She said she saw me the whole time. But I was so in La La Land, I didn't know what was going on. And then I met this really nice Jewish Orthodox boy. His name was Eric which I didn't know that at the time. He had came over and helped me, said, please come to my house. My mom will clean you up. We'll call your family. We'll get you home. Hey, look, uh, I don't live so far from here. You, you, need, you need to call your, fa your family and tell them you're okay. And, you know, come with me. Like, my mom's home. Don't worry. You know, it's like, you know, it's kosher. You know? <laughs> so I tried to get them to come with me, and, and, like, they didn't even answer. They didn't even respond. And, um, and then I saw, like, you know, Red Cross people come over. And I was like, okay, they, you know, they'll be able to take care of it. And I, I started walking away, and something inside said, you know, why don't you just take their picture? Little did I know, Eric took my picture of me, and that's the whole reason why I'm here. And if it wasn't for Eric, I wouldn't be able to tell my story, and I wouldn't be here at all. Eric went back to Israel, where he'd been working. His mother took his pictures into Here is New York. My mom's my new agent, you know. <laughs> I really felt really bad about taking it because I felt like I was in, you know, like it's not, I'm not a photojournalist, you know, I'm, it's not my thing to like infringe on other people's, you know, thing. And, um, and so I felt really bad about it. So really, I, all I was trying to do was help somebody and, and I was selfish for a split second and it turns out I, I did something nice. <laughs> you have to just live your life and God kept me here for a reason. I'm a good person. I'll, I wear my heart on my sleeve. And um, maybe that's why he kept me, you know, I don't know. I'm yet to find out my destiny. Volunteers work around the clock getting the show ready for Chicago. Here is New York is going national. Hundreds of volunteers help out. It's become a family with friendships, love affairs, arguments, and the can-do spirit born in New York on 9-11. As soon as my flash goes off, everyone flick their flashes off, okay? Great. Great. The show becomes a repository for pictures, for stories. It becomes a rallying point. Volunteers and photographers who gave their pictures get together to celebrate six months of Here is New York. The Here is New York pictures have a life of their own now, displayed on the big screen in Times Square as the show moves out across America. First stop is Chicago. Thousands of pictures are part of the Here is New York story as the show goes up in an empty building in Chicago's city center.
the small Wisconsin town of Lake Geneva, they're holding their annual ice sculpture festival. The town has also organized its own display of photographs from here is New York. It's the idea of a local girl who was working in New York on September 11th. Erica Alabarca saw the pictures and persuaded people back home to buy them. I couldn't explain in words what was going on in New York at the time, so this was something that I felt would be awesome to bring here, a, sec a piece of New York, a piece of um, the events of that day so people could gain a, a, a larger perspective. Whatever instigated them to donate, I think, this is the reward of it, and they'll come away with something. And hopefully, I, I think that's sort of the big gift of, of September 11th in a way that people, everyone felt like they could contribute. The Grand Zero viewing platform is now a regular stop on New York's tourist trail. People are obsessed. Some come to bear witness or pray, others just to take pictures and say, I saw it. of Elaine Williamson's place, you look out at Ground Zero. It's the final day of searching for the remains of victims. Elaine and Ron, who feel lucky compared to many, keep finding remnants of their lives. It's an old Chinese pewter pot that my mom bought me one time. But I'm glad I found it, because I loved it. Keep finding treasures of one sort or another. Emotionally, it's, it's kind of getting to me more than it is to Ron. I'm just sort of ready to come back. I want to start my I want to start the new school year settled. Um, and I get anxious over little things. And we'll work here about four hours. That's the most you can work because of the fact that there's so much dust and wearing these masks and so forth is, is intolerable after a few hours. We've thrown out all the TVs, all the soft furniture, the mattresses. They'll also take um, a group of our books yeah. and they'll clean, they'll take, we can keep 50 books and they'll take those and put them into a, what? Do they put them into what they call an ozone oven. And that takes the smell out, and then, of course, they vacuum every page and so forth. So that's pretty costly. We're paying for that. And a lot of things, such as these clothes, uh, will just be either taken to the cleaners or thrown out. Most of them will be thrown out. And I think it's exciting um, to be part of change, and I hope that the downtown will go back to its days of glory. Oh, there goes a mouse. That was cute. <laughs> On a Sunday afternoon in Brooklyn Heights, after seven months, everything seems normal, except for the sense of something missing in the skyline, something ripped from its gums. Like the rest of us, Lucille Blair finds it hard to adjust to the physical wound in the city. The gaping hole down there, it just sort of speaks to everyone constantly. You're constantly reminded that it's what happened because of the atmosphere. That they're not there. They abs they're, they're absent. Um, I, I think it's, it's changed us in, in, in other ways. Though you know, you hear an airplane and you hear it differently. You see an airplane crossing the skyline and you, you have a panic attack. 
you, know, you hear lots of sirens and you wonder when, when a building collapses or you hear there's been a crash, you immediately assume it's a, it's, it's a terrorist attack. And I, I think for, 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 for Americans anywhere, for New Yorkers, I mean, that's, that's, a whole new, that's a whole new way of looking at life. Lucille also finds it impossible to leave her photograph behind. People approach me in the street. Um, people email me, people call me. Um, people sometimes stare at me and I know why they're staring at me. They're trying to figure out why do I know that face? I mean, I'm assuming that's why they're staring at me. <laughs> Um, so, it's, it's, so the picture seems to have taken on a life of its own, really. Lucille's son Liam and his classmates have also found a way to deal with 9-11. They all kind of just sat there and started drawing. And when we looked at the pictures about half an hour later, they had all drawn tall buildings with either airplanes or objects going into them. Um, I think the children were haunted by it in a very... In a quiet way. Even after so much time, almost seven months, Jojo Capestro is still troubled. She's still not back at work. 9-11 has changed my life. Part of me died that day, but then yet another part of me was born. Made me a lot stronger and made me wait when I wake up in the morning, I look at the flowers and I say, thank God I'm alive. Well, thank God I made it out. It's not so easy. I walked, I was in Midtown two weeks ago and I was walking by Trump Tower and I was like, whoa, I got really nervous. You know, my, 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 my knees buckled, I got dizzy. I just took a deep breath, I sipped my water and I just sat down for a minute and then I was fine. That picture made me say, wow. See, do you understand now the way I feel and why I feel like that? Because people didn't understand. You say, oh, she's crazy. I mean, I'm, I'm not all there to begin with, but when you say, oh, she's crazy, she's crazy. I wasn't crazy. That really happened to me. Billy Green struggles to come to terms with the loss of his colleagues. It's April now, and things are not getting better. Searchers have just identified the remains of one of the firefighters from Engine 6. The last man is still missing. For me, it's probably to go on to sleep the day and everything just constantly goes through my mind. You know, it's, it's absolutely horrible. But, uh, you know, you have good days and bad days. You know, I, I don't have any children. So, uh, I feel bad for my wife because I've been devoting a lot of time uh, to the fundraising activities and uh, the different things we're doing for the families here. And it's a lot more time away from home right now. You know, I know she's worried about me, but um, day by day, I'm getting better. I worry about her. You know, I worry about her worrying about me. <laughs> <laughs> think we're moving too fast with Grand Zero? Well, I thought they were moving too fast, uh, you know, uh, I mean, ago. six months ago, because they said, uh, oh, uh, it looks like, uh, you know, they, they wanted to reduce the manpower and uh, and start uh, move, moving on right away, and then, and then, like, two months later, they started finding a lot of bodies. So, uh, you know, shame on them. And then the people were complaining, they, like, they wanted their parking lot back. Yeah. Uh, 3,000 people died there. You want your parking lot back. Come on. I'm trying to forget, even though you can't forget. The one photograph with Here's New York that they captured me, you know, it brings back the memory. The horror that happened that day. In the spring of 2002, I head out across America to talk to people on the other side of the country about what the pictures from Here is New York mean to them. Michael and Maureen Grasso live in a California lotus land community that seems as far as you can get from New York.
like everyone else in the nation, we were you know, completely transfixed with what had happened initially. But for me, when the buildings collapsed, it was, really, it was as if the universe bifurcated. And all of a sudden, it was so surreal, it was like we were living in a different place, in a different universe. It was not the same world. The Grassos packed up their car and drove 3,000 miles to New York to help friends who lived near Ground Zero. And they came across, here is New York. Well, I, I mean, this is interesting in a, in a, for a couple of different reasons. Um, her face expresses grief over what's happened here, but the real tragedy hasn't occurred yet. It's behind her. You know what I'm saying? The towers haven't collapsed, but she's full of grief. So I think there's an interesting dynamic with that. She could have kept walking and never looked back and never would have known, you know, what was actually to come. I just think about each of those people that morning got up, put on their shoes, and did all the things that we do. Had to choose a tie, having no idea that they were going to be faced with this kind of event. And I don't know how they, I don't know how they dealt with it. You know, and I think the question is, how would any of us deal with it? You know, I mean, and these were the husbands, wives, daughters, sons, parents of, of families. It's just, it's unbelievable. And this photograph to me is... For many people, the uh, Here's New York pictures can provide a way of talking about what we all take from 9-11. As a nation and the Western world, we should begin to examine how we treat the Muslim world and third world nations. And, you know, to, to, and I'm not saying what, what happened was justified, but in the minds of the people that did this, uh, they think they were justified in doing it. You know, I don't see a lot of people spending a lot of time trying to pinpoint the source of the, the thought process and the emotions that led those 18 or 19 or 20 guys to do what they did on September 11th. You know, it's typical in this country that we go, hey, he's just a nutcase, you know, we label him a madman, and you don't have to explain it. You don't have to deal with it. I follow the pictures and their buyers into the American West, and I begin to see how different September 11th feels out here, 2,000 miles from New York. With us, it's just so easy to say, oh, that's somewhere else, that's out there, it doesn't matter to us. And I, I hope it was a wake-up call, I really do, I think we need it. I think as Americans, we really, really need to be wakened up to the fact that there's another world out there and they've got different wants and different desires. In Montana, the pictures also look different. To Judith Forseth, they seem almost surreal. It's like being almost a movie set, except this is real. So you're looking at all these wonderful stills of actual drama. And I think we're all, I guess it's like people who, who can't pass up a, a car wreck. You know, I mean, it's just, that's just, that's just human nature. And so here you are, and you've got 5,000 images of something that's much, much worse than a car wreck. And so it's just, it's fascinating. I mean, every detail is fascinating. In Livingston, in rural Montana, the fall of the Twin Towers seems like a bad dream in a faraway place. Some people tell me that on the morning of 9-11, the local radio DJ mentioned an incident in New York and then kept on playing music. At first it feels as if nobody knows much here or cares. But there are people in Livingston who feel connected to 9-11. People like firefighter Doug Lobaugh. Here's a person that I've never seen or had never seen up until that day. Uh, I correlate, you know, how does my life correlate with his? Um, 
he's lost co-workers. I've thought about what it would be like where I work to lose the people that, that I care about and love. You know, we rely on each other day to day. Um, what will his life be like after that? I don't know how many years he has on the job. Will it affect enjoying going to work? Will it affect when he retires, will he, will he continue to do the things he does? Does he love his job that much that, that he's going to continue to stay at the job he's at? Um, and I just feel really, really bad for him. At Chico Hot Springs, the lodge he owns near Livingston, I meet my guard. I would nece not necessarily want to hang this on my wall, but I certainly would look at them from time to time. I would show my children, my grandchildren, I think uh, it's just so people don't forget this horror. I'd like to send a set of these things to all those people that are hating America and say, now are you happy? Does this make you happy? Does this picture make you happy? Does this picture make you happy? Are you happy now? At the Livingston High School, I talked to some kids who have plenty to say about the meaning of 9-11 and about the pictures. I think it really shows there was so much anger and so much loss and confusion on that day and it's really sad to see the people who had to be there and who had to see everything and they had to see the building crashing down and everything and I, I think the worst pictures are the ones of the people and the people who have the looks on their face after they've seen what happened. I think this basically just shows the whole demeanor of the day. I mean, you can see the alarm on her face, and she looks so worried. But to me, that, that is kind of how people were feeling all day, that, and for a couple days after. That's so scary. And to, to know, I bet that's probably the biggest relief in the world, is to know that someone you love is you know, you got through it and you're together and, um, but those poor people, I mean, it's crazy. They, you, someone just going through that, they're going to live with that for the rest of their lives. The Livingston kids also talk about how the pictures reflect their own new awareness of America's place in the world after 9-11. You know, I thought, well, oh, you know, our country's doing good, and we're trying to help other countries, you know, bringing food in, you know, um, just trying to help support people. And um, with this, you know, I was like, you know, why, why did they do this? You know, we didn't hurt no one, you know, we're not trying to cause conflict, and um, it was just a real shocker for me. I was kind of in my own world, just living in Montana, a sheltered community, and when this started going on, I started watching the news, and now I watch it pretty much every morning and read the newspapers, and I had no idea. Of, I was kind of lost, and I had no idea all the conflicts that were going on in the world. So it's kind of a reawakening as to what's going on in this world. The, the government and big corporations are almost the same thing, but the government, or maybe the big corporations, really manipulate the stories because, you know, before September 11th, it was fine that the Taliban oppressed women and did all these things, I guess, to America. But after they attacked us, then, oh my God, you know, the world's over there, these terrible people, we just turned them into villains overnight. Why weren't they villains before? As the first anniversary of 9-11 approaches, there are already plans being made for Ground Zero. Soon the builders will come. With Elaine out of town, Ron Williamson regularly checks on the cleanup at his apartment. My evaluation is that it's like 20% of where it has to go. And so that what we've got rid of is all of the soft stuff, over 200 books. So we're, we're a long way from getting back into this apartment building. Up until the day, I would have said we would be back in by the end of September, beginning of October. But now it looks like it could be as late as what they say, and that is December. Back in January, when we first met the Williamsons, 
They hoped that the devastation of their family home would be cleared away before autumn. Now, Ron and Elaine face more months as 9-11 exiles. But at least the famous tea set has been rescued and restored. Okay. Oh, no, no, it was, no, the first human to orbit. Almost 12 months later, Lucille Blair still finds her life shaped by September 11th. Everything relates back to that day. It's what we did before and what we did after. Well, after September 11th, you know, or well, when September 11th happened, so it sort of, it kind of, sort of it's marked our lives in the city in some strange, horrible way. It's allowed Americans to become very nationalistic, you know, that the, the flags endlessly and shown everywhere and in the name of America, in the name of our country, which makes me a little nervous. I think people kind of turn this event into something else. I noticed you haven't brought the photograph. No, no, I haven't. I mean, one thing I think it would be disturbing to my son to see it. Generally, I mean, I, I have it around. It's disturbing for me to look at it. Um, I don't mean, at, that, at this point, I just had no comprehension of what was really going on. Um, yeah, I, I, it's very painful still to look at it. Actually, I have never worn that jacket again, and I threw that bag away. <laughs> For Billy Green and the men of Engine 6, it's a regular call-out, a fire alarm in the subway. Billy keeps up his routine, but he's always haunted by 9-11. Yeah, he is creeping up on us, right? Seems like everything is getting back to normal for everybody, except us. We're still living this nightmare. We still have one guy missing. We have Lieutenant O'Hagan missing from this house. And we're praying they uh, find his remains. We've come a long way, but uh, you know it's a long way to go. Sleeping better. But uh, still have those tough nights, you know. It's always on our mind, you know. You know I mean, the, funeral, the funerals aren't even over with. It's, it's not like that part has ended yet. It's sad. We've all been very supportive of the families. And uh, I mean, I, I'm in a difficult position. Uh, you know, I was the last one with, uh, with them. And uh, how, I know they're happy for me. I'm sure I bring uh, some sadness to them, too, because, uh, you know, I'm a reminder of what happened. The worst uh, was the jumpers. It was burned into my, into my brain. I always had the vision of it. And, uh, you know, vibrations and loud noises, uh, they still make me jumpy. The subway runs underneath this house, and uh, the house vibrates. And I, I remember the vibration of uh, the North Tower when the South Tower collapsed, and uh, it brings back bad memories. I find it difficult to look at a lot of photographs. Uh, they still bother me. I try and stay away, away from the more graphic ones. Uh, I'm trying to forget. We're all concerned about our health. You know, it's no secret. We all breathe in a lot of uh, horrible uh, contaminants. And uh, frankly, you know, I'm worried. We're all worried, but uh, life doesn't stop. We have to continue on. You want coffee? It's almost a year. Jojo Capestro still replays the horrible events with her mother and sister. She recalls how her mates, some of them died doing it, helped her get out. And the final phone call from the 87th floor. But I could tell there was something wrong in your voice. I know, I didn't want to tell you, you know, the smoke in the office and half our floors blown out and all our doors were melted shut. Thank God for Harry. Steve, if it wasn't for those two guys, I wouldn't be here. And I was so afraid to walk out of that office. I didn't think you'd be here either. I just can't talk about it. Everybody was calling up. I still have dreams night after night after night after night. I have dreams that I'm in the stairwells and I'm telling Harry to come on and I'm like, I have dreams about when I was outside after the tower fell and I came out from under the car and 
Dominique found me, I always dream about that. We were in front of that little church. I dream about that all the time. And I just dream about the buildings falling constantly. That photograph gave me a lot of closure. You know, I'm known to be a drama queen, and everyone always says, oh, yeah, Joanne, Joanne, Joanne. I was, when they saw that picture, they were like, oh, my God, the poor girl. And this, actually, this is the first time we sat since we were at our desks. And what we thought, what we were thinking in this picture is, wow, our building fell, everybody's dead. And I'll never forget the response when I called up my sister Debbie's house, and I was like, Deb? She goes, who is it? I go, it's JoJo, I'm alive. And she goes, it's Joanne, she's alive. It's summer 2002, and JoJo can begin to look forward again. I'm doing much better. Um, I'm out there in Manhattan looking for a job. I'm going back to Wall Street. I thought you said you wouldn't go back. Nah, I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I got the strength, actually, to try and go back into Manhattan, so I've been interviewing. I know that the, the, the Lord will give me a job. It's gone by, and we're still here. Um, we're all tired, but we still feel that, at least through September, that we have more to do. Uh, we're doing something between 10 and 20 exhibitions we'll be doing in September, both in America and abroad. Probably a million people have come to, to these two rather modest little storefronts. There are millions of people on the website. The, the importance of Here is New York has been people. Um, after all, the 9-11 was really about people. It wasn't about buildings. It wasn't about airplanes. And uh, Here is New York, in the end, is about people. They thought it would last for two weeks. Now, after almost a year, the little shop that became Here is New York is still open. New York's scrapbook for 9-11. For more information, please go to www.bbc.co.uk slash September 11. BBC One will be joining the people of New York for a special memorial service at Ground Zero on Wednesday at 1 o'clock.